You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you. Hello and welcome back to Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And we're here to talk about creation and science and origins and Genesis and all that good stuff. Say, Paul, um, tell me about, before we get started here, (laughs) well, first of all, before we get started here, it'd be good if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and leave a like right now because you know you're going to like it. And if you're uh, listening on a podcast platform, don't forget to give us, you know, all the good stars and the good review and all that good stuff. So thank you for that. Now, Paul, before we get started, do you guys do go all out for Halloween over there in the UK? We kind of go crazy mm-hmm. over here in the US. Uh, is that mm-hmm. how it is over there? It's become a much bigger thing in recent years. Uh, I okay. remember when I was a boy that there would always be a few people who sort of went trick or treating. Yeah, um, but it but it wasn't really a big thing. Whereas now uh, you walk into the the shops and they're full of Halloween merchandise. So yeah, it's right. become much much bigger. That must be an it must be the the globalization effect here with America, American <laughs> traditions leaking over to the UK. Yeah, although well, over here we, we probably originated a lot of those traditions and then they kind of uh, uh, translated across the Atlantic. And now they've come back to haunt us again (laughs) (laughs) yes yes and over here we have a lot of we got a lot of christians who are uncomfortable with halloween when i was growing Mm, up same here i trick-or-treated with my friends and and you know i like free candy and Mm. so that was fine and then I guess about college is when I really started hearing about people having harvest festivals. Churches would hold mm. a harvest festival where you, basically you would do Halloween sort of things. You could even dress up, but you weren't allowed to be a like a ghoulish creature, you know, no witches, no mm. devils, which mm-hmm. frankly makes sense to me. Um, mm. And then uh, more recently, it's turned into something called trunk or treat. I don't really understand <laughs> the whole... I guess people come to the church parking lot and just uh, you know open their trunks and then you come around to get candy. I, I'm not real sure how it works. Anyway, I'm not really, I don't really follow all the Halloween alternatives because I don't have kids, so it doesn't really affect me too much. But another one that is that is kind of associated with sort of the, the really nerdy side of, of Christianity, I think, is reformation day right Mm. and so people uh you know i I hear stories of it and i don't know if it's real or if it's just somebody making fun of christians but i hear stories about you know people dressing up as their favorite reformer uh (laughs) silly things like that and like i say i have no idea if it's true but reformation day is this week paul yes and or at least it will be when this when this episode airs uh and I thought it would be a good time for us to talk about the Reformation. What do you think? Yeah, so I have my um, little figure of Martin Luther. Uh, <laughs> so I here, have one of those too. <laughs> you have one of those too. Yes. I so, do. so it's at home. <laughs> so, thirty first of October is uh, Reformation Day uh, when we remember uh, the the day in fifteen seventeen when Martin Luther famously nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church at Wittenberg. So, uh, yeah. So it's a thing. Yeah. And it was, it's, it's a real thing, right? You know, Mm. it's not just some goofy Halloween alternative. It's it, Mm. there was a reason for it. And so Mm. my understanding, I, I visited Wittenberg and I visited the Luther house there and I visited, uh, the, the church there. And my understanding was, so the reason we have Halloween is because it is All Hallows Eve. November mm. 1st is All Saints Day. Yeah. So November 1st is the is the festival for all the saints in case you forget one because there are a lot of them, right? Um I don't really follow that because I'm not Catholic, but there you go. There's there's an All Saints Day for everybody. And so 
So, yeah, and if you wanted to uh, discuss something, if you wanted to um, put up a notice that people would understand, you could nail it to the church door. And if you did it on the, the night before a big festival, then people would come to church and they would see it. So you could talk about it. It was kind of like, you know, Facebook. He, put up, he posted mm. his 95 theses like we would do on Facebook nowadays. Um, have you read the 95 theses, Paul? Uh, I must confess I have not. Yeah, I did. They're extremely technical and kind of dry. Luther was concerned uh, about the selling of indulgences. Mm. Um, and and so a lot of the 95 theses have to do with technical theological points about indulgences. And for those of you listening, mm. indulgences, as I understand them, are like grace coupons, right? So... The idea here in in the in sort of the Catholic mindset of the time was you could certain good deeds would get you some kind of grace credit, right? To get out of purgatory early or get a relative out of purgatory early. And so giving of alms was a good deed. And so that was one way of getting getting grace from God. And so uh this the indulgences sort of made it convenient to do that. They gave you an actual piece of paper that said you had earned some grace, I guess. My my ignorance is showing here. But anyway, so that sort of precipitated Martin Luther's change of mind. And I know that Luther had been, I mean, famously had been in the thunderstorm and and um, nearly struck by lightning and, and devoted him, devoted his life to God spent many years trying to um trying to earn his earn earn the favor of god and never and always failing and never feeling like uh he was good enough and when he finally read uh the book of romans famously then mm -hmm. he he realized this book is very different from what i've been taught and his struggle over this issue then is what leads in part to what we know of as Reformation Day now, and of course the Protestant yeah. Reformation. Yeah. I think that's all right. But you know what? We have a special yeah. guest with us uh, who is going to help us work through uh, the Reformation. So yeah. um, here he is. His name is Nathan Brummel. Hello, Nathan. Hey, how's it going today? Pretty Hi, good. Nathan. Pretty good. How are you? Yeah. Um, Nathan, why don't you introduce yourself? You have a very interesting ministry and, uh, yeah, tell, tell our listeners more about it. Yeah, I have a very unique job because I'm professor of systematic theology and New Testament at Divine Hope Reformed Bible Seminary, which is a dedicated prison seminary. Yeah, that's exactly it, a dedicated prison seminary. It's the second <laughs> oldest dedicated prison seminary in the United States. The first one and the one that was our model is in Angola at the Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary. And about 25 years ago, they started with a, a, a unique program that was directed towards the prisoners there. And one of the most bloody and wild prisons in the South became really an example of gospel transformation. People talk about the Angola miracle. And so what they had is they had guys graduating from their Bible college or seminary who became functioning as pastors and elders for, for years. And then finally, they were actually allowed to be ordained. And so you have 35 or so, you know, self-governing, self-supporting, self-propagating, self-theologizing churches within the Angola prison, which has about, you know, 6,000 some prisoners. Well, up here in the North, in the Midwest, in Indiana and Illinois, we, 10 years ago about, we started a dedicated prison seminary. And now what we do is we have we have three United Reform pastors and one OPC pastor who are full-time faculty. And we have five different campuses and five different prisons. And what we do is we provide a four-year biblical and theological and biblical counseling program. So we have a curriculum that's, you know, similar to a, a reform seminary kind of, you know, matched with a, a Bible college like Moody or Reformation Bible College, except for we really focus on biblical counseling because our students have a lot of issues with addictions or they need to you know, learn about the Christian family and et cetera. Depression is a big issue. So we have entire classes on those things. 
so anyhow, I teach uh, systematic theology in New Testament, although because we do not have a professor of church history that we have, you know, entitled that, I also get to church, teach classes in church history and Reformation history, too, as well. So right now, for example, I'm teaching uh, eschatology and the gospel accounts to 50 students that we have in our campus in Danville Correctional Center in Dan Danville, Illinois. Wow. So when you say mm, this correct. is a dedicated prison seminary, is your campus actually in jail? How yes, our only campus is our, within the correctional centers. So <laughs> in each one of our correctional centers, we have dedicated classrooms and we have brought in theological and biblical libraries. You know, for example, in Danville Correctional Center, we have a library probably about the same size as the library you have at your facility there. And okay. so our students, you know, have the tools to do research and they even have laptop computers they can type their term papers onto. Wow. Mm. Mm. Wow. It's <laughs> pretty fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, um, you, you uh, have told us about that ministry, which is absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's a really unique kind of ministry. Um, tell us also something a, a little bit about your your own background, your your, your own sort of church background, because um, I know you've got several um, degrees in philosophy and theology and so on. J just tell us a bit about that. So I grew up in the Protestant Reformed churches, which is a Dutch Reformed denomination, and I went to the I went to Calvin College initially, where unfortunately I was there in the uh, early 1990s at the time when the Howard Ventil controversy was kind of reaching its climax about him teaching theistic evolution. And so what happened is I was immersed at Calvin College. I was, you know, I, I was very naive. I had no idea I would enter into theology, you know, 102 and have a professor who would be a higher critic who would just shred the Old Testament scriptures and um, have, you know, faculty who would have a very, um, you know, interpret Genesis as a saga, Genesis 1 as a saga, um, and, and attack really the authority of the scripture. So that, I was very naive. I wasn't prepared for that because people, I don't think in the CRC too, the Christian Reformed Church, were quite aware of how far things were, how far things had gone downhill already at that point. Well, I became a philosophy major there. And what happened is that before I went to seminary, I realized that the denomination I was in was quite narrow and even sectarian. So I wanted to kind of broaden my horizons. So I went to graduate school in philosophy, the University of Wisconsin, and studied Jonathan Edwards. And then I went back to seminary for four years. And then I graduated and all of the pulpits in the small denomination were filled. So I went back to Calvin Seminary, worked on the THM in the matter in, in missions and studied J.H. Bavink, who is the great Dutch missiologist from the 20th century. And then I became a pastor and uh, for 10 years. And then when I left the Protestant Reformed Churches, I went over to the United Reformed Churches of North America, and that's where I'm now. And, uh, and then I uh, got started teaching um, at Divine Hope Seminary. That's great. So you're very well qualified, really, to help us with this, because neither, neither Todd nor I... Uh, are uh, church historians or theologians of any yeah. kind, really. Um, we kind of dabble in all of these things and are interested yeah. in them, but we're, we're not experts. So we're really uh, glad to have you here to talk about these things with us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I can't, you know, I've never mm. met you in person. I've never made it to England. Um, mm. Although I don't have Melanchthon's view. One issue that comes up with, with creation is that, you know, Luther needs to pound on the astrologists in his commentaries where he deals with Genesis and the creation of the sun, moon, and stars because his buddy, his, you know, his sidekick, the Robin to his Batman, Melanchthon, had, his dad had received a, a message from the astrologist when he was born that if he ever crossed the English Channel, he would die. And so Melanchthon never, never would visit England. And uh, Luther could never cure him of his astrology views. Huh. Right. <laughs> Well, that's news to me. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, I have I have unfortunately um, already exhausted my knowledge of the Protestant Reformation. Um, I know there's John Calvin involved, and I know that uh, let's see, Zwingli's in there and Tyndale. Could you could you give us a little? I don't know, a little bit of a rundown very quickly on what all is happening in Europe. And who are all these guys, and what's their deal? What are they? What are they upset about, and why are they reforming? Yeah, like you mentioned earlier, there was the huge problem of the medieval view of how a person could become right before God and how you could be justified. And the medieval theologians said it was by faith and plus by your works 
you could somehow have a righteous status before God. And like you mentioned, there was this absurd situation where you had Johann Tetzel going around in Germany trying to sell these indulgences. And you can imagine today, you know, imagine if you heard, you know, if you were told that your grandma who just died, you know, who you loved, and you heard that she was burning in purgatory for 1 million, you know, 385,322 days because of her sins. And now here, Johann Tetzel shows up and says, hey, if you just pay 50 bucks, you can get grandma right out of hell. You know, as soon as the money, you know, falls into the coffer, the soul from purgatory will spring. Well, how could you not, right, cough up 50 bucks for grandma? Right. And so England, I mean, Germany was actually being, you know, uh, emptied of gold coinage because of so many people were making donations to the Roman Catholic hierarchy to get out of hell. Well, uh, well, Martin Luther, when he learned about how these people were trying to hawk indulgences right next to the area where he lived, the region he was in, he decided that he would, you know, have just a pure academic challenge to this notion. Meanwhile, what's happened is he's been lecturing on the Psalms and Romans, and he's coming to perceive that what the Apostle Paul says in Romans is is teaching that no the righteousness of god is not just his condemning righteousness by which he condemns sinners to hell who are sinners but instead actually it's the imputation of the perfect righteousness of christ to sinners through faith alone in jesus and what's happening he's beginning to perceive that so he's beginning to understand the good news of the gospel that salvation is all by grace it's a free gift and that the sinner you know, he was a monk who had a very tender conscience that he could be forgiven and justified by grace alone through faith alone. And so, you know, he's he's beginning to perceive these things, partly because he's reading the Bible and he has almost naively, you know, begun to read the Bible as if the Bible is the final authority on all matters of faith and life, even though, you know, theologically he's been raised to think that, no, church tradition counts as so much. So what happens is that, you know, as you said, he just wants to have a debate and God suddenly takes the, those 95 theses and has them translated and spread all around Europe. And so the Protestant Reformation is triggered in Germany. And then, you know, Luther would talk about all he did is sit in Wittenberg, you know, with, with Melanchthon and drink Wittenberg beer and God sent his word out. And, uh, and then meanwhile, you know, independent of him, what happens is that a guy named Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland is also a very much a student of the word of God. I mean, he memorized the entire Greek Bible as he learned Greek, and he begins also perceiving the doctrine of justification that's being taught in the scripture, and he begins to see that the Bible doesn't teach all about all these human traditions. So the Reformation is triggered simultaneously in Switzerland and in Germany too. And then what happens is that you have Calvin and others who are second generation reformers who, you know, build on what Luther has accomplished. Mm. So in effect, there are kind of a series of reformations in various European countries. And this sort of flame, this, this spark that Luther ignites with this provocative kind of posting of these theses just spreads, doesn't it, like a wildfire throughout Europe at that time. And uh, and eventually, of course, becomes a a worldwide movement. And of course, there was a there was a lot of precursors as well to um, to, to Luther. Um, you know, Luther didn't just come out of nowhere in, in, in a vacuum. Um, there were all kinds of other things going on, weren't there? In terms of um, the invention of the printing press that allowed for uh, you know Bibles to be produced, and there was. Uh, kind of a rediscovery of the biblical languages and wanting to get the Bible out in people's vernacular languages so that the common people could could read it, as well as a concern for, as you were saying, all of the abuses around indulgences and so on that were going on in the church at that time. So it's a fascinating period. I mean, we can, we can hardly do it justice to it, really, can we, in, in such a short um, podcast? But uh, that that's a very helpful sort of introduction to, you know, to put to put things in context for you know, about what Luther did, um, and I guess that kind of brings us on to the next point, um, Todd, which is you know we we kind of wanted to explore a little bit about uh, what did the reformers think about creation? You know what what was what was the thinking in the church generally prior to the Reformation? 
And then, you know, what did the reformers think? Because one of the, one of the things that's often kind of said about young age creationism is that in effect, it's a, a 20th century novelty. It's a kind of theological aberration, uh, perhaps that sprang out of uh, Seventh Day Adventism or some something like that. So, you know, this is very commonly uh, how it's portrayed. Uh, but those of us who are young age creationists, I think, actually see ourselves as standing in the tradition of mainstream Christianity. And, you know, it, I think it would help for us to go back and look at what people throughout church history have been saying about these subjects to, to, to see whether this really is just some sort of novelty that began in the 20th century. So where should we begin, Todd, do you think? Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, I, 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 that's a good, that's a good question. First, a little context here. I think it's important yep. for us. I think there's always a temptation um, in these sorts of modern debates. Uh, there's always that temptation to sort of go back uh, into the theology of the past and look for famous names who agree with us. Right. Yeah. And, and therefore, you know, these, these, these long dead theologians get, zombified and pressed into service to, <laughs> to, to, to fight the good fight for us. And, and I don't, I, I want to just, I wanted to say that right now, mm -hmm. because I think there's a bigger context here that we really don't have a lot of time to go over, mm -hmm. but the Protestant reformers are going to talk about, these guys are not just sort of making up their own weird ideas, uh, during the reformation. Um, they are, they are inheriting, centuries of biblical interpretation. So they are not simply reinventing all of biblical theology or biblical hermeneutics, uh, even though they are going to put some emphases on certain things that might be a little different from previous generations. Um, so so the, the, the long church tradition of, of basically viewing Genesis 1 through 11 as a reliable historical record of of uh, the earliest history of the earth uh, that's that's there that stream of thought runs from the, the the church fathers the first generation after the apostles the New Testament authors themselves all the way to the present so I, I just want to assure our viewers we are not quote mining or cherry picking or any of that other stuff trying to make us look big and beat up on the theistic evolutionists. Um, we're we're actually going to try to talk about legitimate views that were generally understood uh, among a bunch of different reformers. So I think that's important to say. So first of all, why don't we just start with the days of creation? So, and the mm. span of time involved and the whole issue of young, right? So if, if we're young earth or young age creationists, we're marked off by this bizarro belief in the modern world that somehow the, the earth is only thousands of years old. How could that be? Um, is that something that the reformers actually thought about? Is that something that they considered. And I will accept here not just the span of creation, but also thoughts about the genealogies and their value in sort of pinning down the actual the actual date of, of, of the age of the earth exactly. So how about we start there? Any thoughts, Nathan? Yeah, I think the point you made is quite important about the fact that we have a long exegetical tradition coming up to the time of the Reformation. Sometimes people don't understand that today. Even, for example, I come from the Dutch Reformed tradition. Well, it's very interesting that within the Dutch Reformed tradition, there's not only a profound exegetical tradition that's among the Orthodox Reformed, the later um, 19th and early 20th century um, biblical theologians that's in commentaries, but also it's verbal as well. Now, when we think back to the time of the Reformation, you have that too. You have commentaries, of course, that are being read, but you also have verbal traditions happening. Um, but one thing that is clear is that if you go back to, like you mentioned, the fact that some people would claim that creationism is a 20th century, century novelty. Well, that would be a surprise to Ephraim the Syrian, the Syrian back in the fourth, fourth century who 
explicitly, you know, is challenging this notion that the days of creation are like symbolic or not natural or real or ordinary days. And then remember the Protestant re reformers didn't reject everything in the medieval tradition. For example, when it came to this, you know, the length of the days of creation, they would be reading people like Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas, of course, when you look at his discussion of this topic, he spends his time in the Summa Theologica basically, you know, disagreeing with Augustine's odd observations about how, you know, the, the six or seven days of creation were basically just one day. And he, in, in contrast to that, is defending the fact that they are ordinary, you know, literal historical days. He use, even uses the word 24 hours to refer to them. And so, yes, when you come to the time of the Protestant Reformation, you find also that the reformers are part of that medieval exegetical tradition that is understanding the days in an ordinary way. So if you come to Calvin, for example, he says, notice how he's right away responding to Augustine. He says, here, the error of those is manifestly refuted who maintain that the world was made in a moment. For it is too violent a cavil to contend that Moses distributes the work which God perfected at once into six days for the mere purpose of conveying instruction. He says, rather, let us conclude that God himself took the space of six days for the purpose of accommodating his works to the capacity of men. And you can find the same things you know, being taught by Luther as well, or by very prominent, you know, Lutheran theologians who are contemporaries with uh, Luther. For example, Johann Brins, who was very close to Luther, and he was a, he was actually trained under Oikolampadius, who was a Reformed theologian, even though he agreed with Luther on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper and held to consubstantiation. But Johann Brins, he was a Reformer in Southern Germany, who was, a, who was a moderate German, but he also, you know, made statements about, about the six days and would say things like, first of all, scripture itself clearly testifies that the days during which creation was completed are natural days, not mystical or allegorical. And he says, if they weren't natural days, then the creatures would be natural creatures, but they would be only allegorical creatures. So notice how we find first generation reformers, you know, talking about the days of Genesis in terms of ordinary days. Yeah. And of course, yeah. that gets picked up, doesn't it, by uh, those who come in later generations who are very much standing in that same tradition. Um, I, I came across, uh, it, it, as I was preparing for the podcast, I, I came across an interesting uh, quotation by William Perkins, who was a Cambridge Puritan. Uh, and uh, he, he said this, he said, some may ask, in what space of time did God make the world? I answer, God could have made the world and all things in it in one moment because that's Augustine's view. But he began and finished the whole work in six distinct days. That's in his exposition of the creed. So, you know, the, the, these ideas uh, are common ideas. The, these, these are not sort of fringe ideas, are they? Um, and there is this, um, what's quite interesting is there is this sort of distancing from uh, the Augustinian view uh, about the creation days. Um, that seems to be um, a, a kind of common theme that I see when I'm reading these Reformation period writers. Um, the, it might be worth us just sort of briefly talking about the way that the church fathers, the patristics, um, sort of thought about Genesis, just to kind of give a little bit of context to, to then what the reformers are, d are doing here in distancing themselves from Augustine. Do you think that would be helpful just to uh, yeah, I think, so. think about that? So, uh, Todd, I, I know you've uh, talked a, a little about this, but the um, the church fathers, uh, they've, they're quite complex to, to, to understand. Um, the, the, the way that they interpret scripture um, is often one that's not sort of very familiar to us today. But they distinguish, don't they, between uh, literal interpretation and allegorical interpretation. Yeah, and, there's there's that distinction, yeah. and and then there's, I mean, by the time you get to the Middle Ages, there's sort of agreement that every text of Scripture has at least four. There's fourfold mm. interpretation. So you have a yeah. And if I'm remembering them all correctly, let's see if I can remember them. There's the there's the literal <laughs> interpretation. There's the bare words. Yeah. 
then there's, yeah. I believe there's a Christological interpretation where all of scripture points to Christ. I mm -hmm. think that's right. And then I know there's a, there's a, a moral interpretation mm -hmm. where you're supposed to figure out how to live your life. And then there was a heavenly interpretation where all the mm -hmm. things in scripture are symbols of, of the coming kingdom or the, or the situation as it is in heaven. Um, mm -hmm. And so today in our modern world, it's weird and it doesn't seem weird to us because we just, we think in these categories, but, but the idea that you could have someone out there saying or arguing that Genesis is clearly intended to be read in a theological fashion, telling us theological truth in a non-literal way, as though one allegorical reading could discredit a literal interpretation. That was not yeah. something that no. was really that well, well, they had it, but it wasn't, it wasn't a major theme, right? Because they would, they would understand multiple interpretations. So Nathan, when we come to the, when we come to the Reformation, one of the phrases we know there's there's five solas, right? And one of them is sola scriptura. Um, and I that's Latin, right? So it means scripture alone. Is that right? Can you can you explain to us what the significance of that was? Yeah, you know, most of us who are children of the Reformation, we're familiar with the language of sola scriptura, that the scriptures alone are the only, you know, foundation and source of what for doctrine and life. And so the Reformation, you know, was a Copernican revolution because it was a return to this idea that scripture is the final authority on whatever you must believe. Now, maybe people don't understand, like you've just mentioned, that the Reformation also was a Copernican revolution in hermeneutics. And basically, it was a rejection of allegorical exegesis. So, for example, one of the famous uh, passages that the Reformers would use to, you know, very consciously reject um, allegorical exegesis, went, which went back to the church father Origen, and then Augustine, of course, used as well in his interpretation of Genesis, is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Origen and Augustine, for example, they, they play all kinds of games with it. They say, well, you know, the man who's walking down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he is Adam. Right. And then the men who come and beat on him, they're the devil. And, you know, when the man is half dead, well, that's a picture of he's dead in trespasses and sins. And so the craziness is that you have in that story, you know, you have a Gentile heretic. Suddenly they, you know, transmogrify a, gen a Gentile heretic, a Samaritan, you know, into Christ, which is almost blasphemous, problematic. But anyhow, you'll find that Calvin and all the reformers say, no, that's not what this parable is about. This parable is instead about, you know, it's a lawyer who is who is trying to justify himself and say he loves the neighbor and Jesus is showing him, no, the high standard is that like the good Samaritan, the story, you need to love even your worst enemies. And so Jesus wants that, you know, lawyer to see that he is a terrible sinner who, you know, who needs the righteousness that is found in Christ. He needs a savior. And anyhow, that that's kind of a classic text passage in which the reformers would reject allegorical exegesis. So yeah, the reformation was a rejection of that approach to reading scripture and then sola scriptura is, of course, foundational. It's called the formal principle of the Reformation. And that goes back to Aristotle's language of formal causes. And basically, you know, what is the thing that's determining or leading the Reformation? That's the pattern that's going to lead to what people hold. Well, it is viewing the scriptures as the final authority. And then justification by faith is the material principle, we say, of the Reformation. Well, how is it that you can know that, you know, that there is such free grace and justification. Well, it is through sola scriptura, through reading the scriptures as the final authority, not caring what tradition says or what, you know, papal decisions might say. You know, for Luther, the doctrine of scripture was very important. Within the last, you know, last century, people have tried to claim that Luther was basically a, a higher critic or a modernist in his view of scripture. But you know, listen, Luther would say things like, the scriptures have never erred. He would say, the Holy Scripture is God's word written and to, so to say, in lettered. He would say, you know, we must regard every tittle and letter of the Bible as more important than the whole world and tremble before it. He says, uh, 
to put it briefly, believe everything or nothing. So he has all these strong statements. He says the Bible is God's word written, presented in letters as Christ is the eternal word presented in human nature. So, you know, he has all these strong statements about the scriptures and, and see, that's, that's the, the burning issue today too. You know, what authority do the scriptures have to say about the doctrine of creation? And Luther's view is that, hey, it doesn't matter what you read. It doesn't matter how important the books are. The Bible is a very unique book. It is the word of God in scripturated. You've been listening to Todd and Paul Talk Creation. If you'd like more information about any of the subjects discussed in the show, please visit us at coresci.org slash podcast. That's coresci.org slash podcast. If you'd like more information on sponsorship opportunities, or maybe you'd like to have a product or book reviewed or discussed on our podcast, please contact us at podcast at coresci.org. That's podcast at coresci.org. Is Genesis History is the film that is a first step on the journey toward understanding the history of the Earth according to Genesis. Follow along with narrator Del Tackett as he travels across the continent with over a dozen scientists and scholars to see fascinating new evidence of creation and a global flood. This film is free to watch on the Is Genesis History YouTube page, along with all the Beyond features which dig deeper into young Earth creationism. Be sure to check out the new creation blog as well, which is sponsored by the film at newcreation.blog. That's newcreation.blog. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Let's uh, move on to uh, talk a little bit about um, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, maybe. Um, Mm. That's kind of a big hot button question today in uh, the evangelical world. There are a lot of evangelicals who are sort of well, they've already decided that evolution is the way God created things, so they're trying to figure out how do we how do we salvage from that the essential bits and pieces of what we need for Christian theology. Um, and Adam and Eve, and in particular their sin and the fall, that seems to be one theme that keeps coming up. We got to figure out how to make that work. Whereas us creationists. Well, they were naked in a garden. Eve talked to a snake. I don't know how the snake talked back, but it happened. And now we have sin. So um, the reformers, are they closer to, say, the young age creationist view? Or are they closer to the more maybe non-historical view? Do we have, is it definitive in that regard? What do we know? Yeah, I mean... Luther, Luther and Calvin, for example, when you begin to read what they say about the creation of Adam and Eve, it is so, it's so, it's such a world of difference from what you get today from science about, you know, an evolutionary view of origins. It is, it's so striking because it's such a dramatic contrast. For example, Luther, when he talks about Adam, he talks about Adam in such a high sense. You know, we, today, theologians talk about the noetic effects from, of the fall. We say that the effect of the fall was that our minds are affected. Of course, we're, we're affected morally and spiritually too. But Luther, he goes beyond that. I mean, he, he talks about how, you know, mentally, for example, Adam was created with just an astonishing memory that his analytic skills, of course, would be far beyond anything we have today. And then he even takes it over into Adam's actual physical abilities and his eyesight. I mean, he talks in terms of how, he, he, he talks about how, how, how Adam's eyesight, he says, were so sharp and clear, they surpassed those of the lynx and the eagle. And then he talks about, you know, uh, not notice he's kind of overdoing things here. I don't yeah. think that Adam really had these superhuman almost things, but notice how, how radically different this is from the idea that humans, of course, have, you know, yeah. by tooth and claw have come up from lower forms of life. And then he says he was stronger than lions and bears, whose strength he admits is very great. Then he says, um, and he handled them the way that we handle puppies. So notice how he is talking about Adam as if he has this, you know, this amazing strength, all this mental acuity. So he has a very high view of man as he is originally created for one. And then with Calvin, on the other hand, you find, of course, also a very interesting discussions about the splendid, you know, the splendid character of, of Adam and Eve. And, you know, all of the reformers want to talk about the image of God and what that all involves. Some, you know, talk about how the image of God involves dominion. Others, like Luther, emphasize it's the ethical purity and the true knowledge of God that Adam and Eve have. 
Luther, uh, Calvin, you know, well, in his commentary discusses, well, the words likeness and image, because the medieval and, you know, early church fathers had kind of tried to distinguish between the image and likeness. Calvin says there's no basic difference between image likeness, and he talks about how, you know, that refers to the image of God in the narrower sense in terms of ethical purity, original righteousness. But Calvin also, of course, emphasizes the splendid gifts that God gave to Adam and Eve. And he talks about how the very fact that God, when he creates Adam and Eve, stops and he actually has a conference, as it were, within the Holy Trinity, how that, you know, brings honor to mankind who God is making in his image. Hmm. And what do the reformers say uh, about the creation of Adam and Eve? Uh, because obviously we have the, you know, the Bible telling us that Adam is made from the dust of the ground. You know, Eve is made from Adam's side. Uh, did did the reformers understand that in a straightforward historical sense that that is exactly what God did, or or did they interpret those things in a in a more sort of metaphorical kind of kind of fashion, which is quite common today? No, of course they. They took it in a, in, a, in a natural sense of the scriptures. They had returned, <laughs> remember, to understand the scriptures in a literal, no, the word literal is problematic because people become literalistic, but he, they all understand the scriptures in a very natural way. So, of course, they take this to be a historic event, and they will all talk about how Adam is made out of the clay. They'll even have interesting discussions about how the animals, too, the beasts of the field were formed out of the ground. And then you'll find that Calvin, um, given the translation he had, of Genesis 1 verse 20 thinks that maybe the birds were created out of the water. So he'll have an interesting discussion of that and and talk about how that's, well, that's, if God can create things ex nihilo, certainly he can make birds out of the water if that's what he did. But yeah, so the reformers clearly understand, you know, God making Adam first, but they emphasize too that in Genesis 1, it emphasizes that God makes a man, male and female, even though they all take Genesis 2 to be a further description, of course, of what uh, God does in creating Eve from the rib of Adam. Mm -hmm. Do they ever have anything yeah. to say about um, the differences in Genesis one and two? I know you listeners out there are not familiar with this. There's a, there's a, there's a pretty strong tradition among critical scholarship that, that somehow the days of creation in Genesis one, one through two, four record a totally utterly contradictory version of creation than the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Um, I've always thought that to be um, wildly exaggerated, <clears throat> the differences. Um, do the reformers notice that they're different, that the accounts are different, or do they just see it as an expansion of day six? Yeah, I think it would be an anachronism to find that sort of concept in them. Yeah. It was a later development, clearly. So they basically saw this as, you know, day, you know, the days of creation are summarized and then God explains more about what he did on day six, which is how I understand yeah. most of Christianity has understood it. Okay. It's interesting yeah. to look at passages too, like Genesis 2 verse 5, because Genesis 2 verse 5, which talks about, you know, um, the certain plants were created and had not yet rained. Well, Meredith Klein has made a lot of hay out of that. And you men might be familiar with the fact that Meredith Klein, who became an advocate of the framework hypothesis, you know, influenced people like Howard Ventil in his book, The Fourth Day. He, um, he claims that he finds in Genesis 2, verse 5, this principle, this big principle that God never used, uh, no, that God always used ordinary providence during the six days of creation. And that leads Klein's followers to deny the historicity of the days of creation. Well, it's interesting when you look at Calvin, for example, on Genesis 2, verse 5. Calvin, you know, is, is of course, dealing with this passage, and whereas Klein thinks that he finds a principle here that, um, that God always used ordinary providence during the six days of creation, and therefore that he, therefore, he argues that God, for example, um, didn't create any plants until after it began to rain. You have other people like uh, Robert Godfrey, who following that so whole scenario, for example, you know, have all different funny ideas about, you know, like, like when the sun, moon, and stars were created and thinks they're created, for example, by the first day or something like that. Um, but when you look at Calvin, what is, what is kind of funny is that, you know, far from finding Klein's interpretation, a sort of novel interpretation of that, that passage, 
Um, instead, you know, uh, Calvin assumes that the passage is teaching that, you know, that miracles are in fact happening during the first six days of creation. And the, the miracle has to do with how God in an extraordinary providence is watering all of the plants that are being mentioned using the vapor with which he waters the earth. And so, you know, uh, so Calvin certainly doesn't find that that passage is teaching that there are only normal providential means being used during the creation week. In fact, he argues that during the creation week, there already are extraordinary providences. And he assumes that there are plants that have already been created by that time, even though it hasn't rained. Hmm. My point is, if you look at such of the exegetical things, you see that Calvin is disagreeing with some later developments. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And what did the reformers think about the original creation in terms of its goodness? How did how did they understand that? Because this is an area where there's a, a radical difference between those of us who are young age creationists and how we understand the goodness of the original creation and how, for example, a, a theistic evolutionist or evolutionary creationist would would understand that. Um, so, you know, d d did the did the reformers think that the creation uh, was changed in some way at the time of the fall? Were there were there physical changes to plants and animals, uh, to humans? Uh, what did they think about death? Was it just spiritual death that came in with the fall, or or is, uh, you know, are, are they thinking in terms of physical death as well? How, how do they understand those things? The reformers all thought that God had created the world good and everything in it was good. So I think they all would have denied the idea of there being death and you know animals with tooth and claw killing each other before the fall. For example, Ulrich Zwingli talked about how the serpents or the snakes that existed originally uh, were good. He says everything was good, even venomous things. So the point is there were no poison snakes, snakes existed. And then Calvin emphasizes that in the beginning, God said, you know, let there be all this plant life, but he did not initially say, let there be thorns and briars. That would be something later on that would become as a consequence of the fall. So they, they certainly have a very Edenic view of the created world, a place of peace and beauty and perfect holiness. And the whole idea, remember the image of God that Adam and Eve have points to their ethical purity. And it's only, yeah, it's only the fall that brings about death in the animal world mm. yeah that's very interesting yeah that's very interesting well um d i think that probably brings us to the flood is yep i was just gonna that say right? that <laughs> yeah so uh this is another area where um you know there are distinct differences in in how uh, today you know creationists understand the flood compared to uh you know, those who take an evolutionary uh, view. And I'm intrigued to know what the reformers um, thought about the worldwide flood, or did they think it was worldwide? Um, you know, what, what did they think that the flood actually did? Um, was it a significant turning point in Earth history, or, or would they have seen it as something that just happened in the, in the ancient Near East? Yeah, on John Calvin's part, for example, he clearly affirms in his commentary in Genesis that the flood was a worldwide event. He emphasizes the fact that the whole world is covered, emphasizes that all human beings die. And once again, I think that was simply normative for the age and for the exegetical tradition. They understood the flood to be worldwide and to be a cataclysm. What's interesting, I think to me, is just some of the discussions they make about various elements of the account of the flood of Noah. For example, I love how they will emphasize things about how uh, God actually closes the door of the ark. It's interesting, I once listened to a sermon where the minister missed that whole point. And Calvin talks about the fact that when Noah and his family got into the ark, that what happened is that it was actually God who sealed the door. Calvin says, well, no, have come up with enough pitch even to secure the door to keep it from leaking. And he says so that, you know, Moses makes sure that we don't, you know, speculate about this. He tells us that God actually, you know, shut the door and sealed it. And that's why it never leaked during the flood. And uh, also, it's interesting how Calvin will talk about the animals arriving at the ark. And he talks about how basically God sovereignly must have led the animals he wanted to survive to Noah and brought them into the ark. So that's, it's interesting to see some of his, uh, comments on these on these matters mm. 
That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And I think Luther, if I remember rightly, uh, talks about uh, even uh, shells on mountaintops being evidence that once the, the whole globe was underwater at the time of the flood. So, you know, they, they were even pointing to physical evidences that people could still see, you know, people could go and see these things. And they, they were saying this is evidence of, of the flood. Now, that so is interesting. interesting. It's interesting because it shows that even though the reformers, you know, had held to sola scriptura, they were not scared of doing science. And for you men who engage in science, it's very interesting that Calvin is very keen to defend the legitimacy of doing science and, you know, encourages people to do science. Now, he does that very interestingly in his discussion of the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. And, and there he, it's very interesting be, because he defends the fact that, you know, that Moses describes these things in a way that ordinary people can understand. So, you know, little children can even understand what is being said in Genesis 1. He says, uh, he talks about how Moses wrote in a popular style, he says, without instruction, so that all ordinary persons endued with common sense can understand. But then see, he talks about how um, yeah, God accommodates to us. He uses, you know, the Holy Spirit through Moses to educate us in what he calls the common school. But then he also talks about how but wait a minute here. Don't be don't be critical of people involved in astronomy. Yes, you know Luther and Calvin want nothing to do with ast astrology with superstition. But he says, but astronomers investigate with great labor whatever the sagacity or sagacity of the human mind can comprehend. Nevertheless, the study is not to be reprobated nor the science to be condemned because some frantic persons are want boldly to reject whatever is unknown to them. And he talks about how astronomy is pleasant and useful and displays it admirable wisdom of God. So there you have an affirmation for engaging in science in different spheres. Yeah. Mm. And it makes sense that it would be astronomy. Uh, the church was long very supportive of astronomy because uh, they needed to schedule their festivals correctly. So they needed to track the time and make sure Easter was on the same day for the entire church spread out across Europe and uh, the Middle East. And so uh, yeah, there there had been a long tradition already in in the church of of supporting uh, astronomical studies, which is probably some of the reason why it becomes such a contentious issue a hundred years later, with a uh, hundred years after Luther, with uh, Galileo and Kepler and so forth. So, but yeah, yeah, that that doesn't surprise me that they would be very, very much in favor of um, astronomical science. Another thing that is striking about all of the reformers is that they are reading, for example, Genesis as as a, as a text that God inspired Moses to write, and so they aren't approaching it with any of the higher critical tools, claiming that you know this part is from some Yahwist, Yahwistic, you know, tradition or author, and this is from some priestly tradition. They are taking this to be the writings of Moses, inspired by God, and you know this is I think important for today too because. You know, today the issue is, well, what's what sort of weight do you give to Darwin's scientific work about evolution? Or what, what kind of weight do you give to contemporary scientific writings on evolutionary thought or about origins? And, you know, in biblical studies, there can be issues that arise like this. For example, you know, to what extent should you understand the biblical teaching on covenant in terms of like what whatever ancient Hittite you know, treaties were like, okay, that's great. We can study what ancient Hittite treaties were like, but in the end, sola scriptura means that it's going to be the scriptures that determine what is actually meant by the covenant of grace. And Luther said, he says, scripture is the true Lord and master of all writings and doctrines on earth. When scripture is no longer master and judge of tradition, teachings lose themselves in the salty sea. And see, that what that's what happens too, see, when you study origins. If you don't give weight to sacred scripture and what scripture says on matters scientific or whatever. Hmm. Excellent. Excellent. I think that is a good word to sort of start wrapping up. Um, hmm. Thank you for being with us, uh, Nathan. Can you tell us uh, where we can learn more about Divine Hope? Divine Hope does have a website online, divinehope.net, I think where just there's some brief information about our seminary.
Okay. Mm-hmm. Are you on social media too? Can we, uh, can we follow Divine Hope there? Um, really, we don't have much social media for this seminary. Makes sense. Although I have my own, I have my own website, which is called the Old Calvinists, playing off on the fact that there are the new Calvinists today. I come from the more historic Reformation, you know, Dutch Reformed tradition, so it's called the Old Calvinist. The Old Calvinist. All right. And it's been that sort of too. My son has some uh, stuff, so, some stuff on creation as well. Oh, okay, great. That's great. All right. It's been um, a, it's been a really interesting discussion, and yeah. uh, you know, the, I, I, I'm sure there's there's so much more that we could kind of dig into. Um, but that that's been very very helpful to so give us a an overview of the thinking of the reformers on on uh, creation and the flood and so on. It's been been really interesting. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to your discussions. Glad to be with you, man. Yeah. All right. Um, for those of you listening, uh, remember again: um, if you're watching us on YouTube, leave us a like. If you're watching us, if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, leave us a nice review, please. Uh, and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your enemies, uh, whoever you got. Um, we would love to expand our uh, audience of eager listeners. Um, you can find out more about uh, my ministry, Core Academy of Science, at coreside.org slash connect. There you'll find links to all of our social media pages and so forth. Um, Paul, where can I find out more about Biblical Creation Trust? Uh, you can find us on Facebook if you just search for Biblical Creation Trust. We have a, a, a Facebook page that we keep regularly updated. Uh, and you, we also have a website. It's biblicalcreationtrust.org. And on our homepage, uh, you can find a button that will allow you to sign up for our prayer news, our regular emails, and also a button to donate. Um, So, you know, if you want to support the work that we're uh, doing, then uh, click on the donate button and it will take you to all of the options. And Todd, how how would people give to Core Academy? Same deal. We got a a donate button on every page, or you could just go to coresci.org slash donate. Uh, there you'll learn about the various options that you can uh, use to support uh, the production of the podcast and support the rest of the Core Academy ministry. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I guess we'll see you back here in a fortnight. We're going to talk about a creationist identity crisis kind of thing. Um, How do we, how do we identify ourselves? Who are we? What do we believe? Should be an interesting conversation. I think, um, It's all about words and names and labels and that sort of thing. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay. We'll see you next time. All right. See ya. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Let's Talk Creation. If you have questions, send them to podcast at coreside.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you.